Well, friends, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Esther, the book of Esther, chapter 4. We're going to be reading a bit from there, chapter 4, page 710 in the uh, black colored Bibles in your pews, page 710, Esther chapter 4. We're going to read that in a little bit, the first 14 verses. And uh, kids, I have a little bit of a mission for you. Later on, as the uh, service um, um, progresses, as the sermon progresses, you're going to hear a lot of words that rhyme with the word straw or claw. You get the idea? They rhyme, right? Straw and claw. So there's going to be a lot of words like that, and they're eventually going to uh, be on the screen. But um, follow along that way. So listen for those key words, and then maybe think about what's the most important awe word that you heard in the message. Maybe you can tell me sometime, Uh, but uh, just so you know that that's coming. Beloved in Christ, let me set the scene for you. Lord God had rescued Israel out of the land of slavery in Egypt. That's a reference point for us. The Exodus about uh, 1450 B.C., way back there. Then God settled his people in the promised land of Canaan. God made Israel into a great nation. And for a time, Israel was ruled by judges, then by kings, King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and then a bunch of other ones too some very sinful, some wonderfully righteous, and gradually Israel, God's chosen people, fell into the worship of idols and other gods, the gods of the nations around them. So eventually, as the Lord God said he would do, if the people did this, he punished them. He sent them into captivity. The great people of Israel, his beloved people, and that great nation was scattered. The northern kingdom of Israel was deported, and then 140 years later, the southern kingdom of Judah was exiled to Babylonia. In the meantime, on the world stage, the Assyrian and Babylonian empires who took the Israelites captive and got taken over by the Persian Empire, led by great kings like Cyrus and Darius. And during that time, slowly, the people of Israel are allowed to begin to return to the promised land. Some of them go, some of them stay. The story of Esther tells us about a group of Jews who stayed in Persia. They lived in a city called Susa, about 650 miles east of Jerusalem, long way from home. And in just a few more years, Ezra and Nehemiah will lead some of these same Israelites back home to Israel. But the story of Esther is just a few years before that happens, right around 450 B.C. So, 1,000 years after the greatest saving event in the Old Testament, the exodus from Egypt. A thousand years later, this is. And at the time of the book of Esther, who is king over the massive kingdom of Persia, a big, tall, impressive, powerful, emotionally unstable, proud, intolerant, quick-tempered king named Xerxes. He is nothing like his father Darius and his grandfather Cyrus. They were great leaders of their empire, leadership ability, military might. They knew how to be kings. King Xerxes, not so much. But he's in charge of everything that his pa and grandpa built up in Persia, a kingdom that extended 3,200 miles from northern India to, or from modern day India to Sudan. But He's just not the kind of guy who should be king. I, the mighty king, king of kings, king of populous countries, king of this great and mighty earth, far and near. That's an inscription that he made about himself, full of himself, unstable. To put it mildly, you walked on eggshells whenever you were around King Xerxes, an all-powerful, emotionally unstable egomaniac. And there came a point... When his wife, Vashti, the queen, crossed him, he got a little drunk, ordered his wife to come out to show her off and display her beauty with the royal crown on her head for all his drinking buddies, and when summoned, she refused, refused to come out, and she was summarily banished from ever entering his presence again, and her crown was to be given to someone else. Lo and behold, we meet Esther a Jew, 
one of the exiled people, one of God's chosen people. She's gorgeous. And when Xerxes, the king, decides to have a beauty contest to determine his next queen, Esther, or Hadassah, her Jewish name, Esther was entered into the contest, and she won. First prize, she becomes queen. At the same time, her uncle, Mordecai, also a Jew, is in the middle of a feud with one of the king's officers named Haman. Haman hates Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman and pay him honor when he walked by. And Haman even hates Mordecai's race, the Jews. And Haman convinces the king, Xerxes, to 11 months hence to annihilate all the Jews from existence in Persia, holocaust them. And Xerxes put it in writing even. But Jews will be destroyed, killed, annihilated. This annihilation was issued as law from Xerxes. So the stage is set. And we read chapter 4 through verse 14. Let's go. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter in. In every province to which the edict had order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courts without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this, at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish, and who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've been thinking quite a bit about uh, mission outreach, this theme of ours, for such a time as this. That's our theme. You saw, I'm sure, that it came right out of verse 14, didn't it? And you now know the context of why Mordecai says that sentence to Esther for such a time as this. But before we get to that theme phrase, I want to offer a couple more phrases like that one. And the first phrase is this, for such a trend as this. In the true story we read, there is a trend happening. Not a good one either for God's people. There is a new law, that's your first rhyme word, kids, on the books there. There's a new law on the books being dispatched all around town and in the surrounding part of the empire. A new law. God's people are doomed, headed for annihilation. Whatever goodwill they may have enjoyed from the king, from that first Grandpa Cyrus and then Papa Darius, that goodwill is now evaporating. Or you could put it this way, that goodwill is starting to thaw. With the new law, that goodwill towards God people will now thaw. The law brings the thaw, you see? 
Picture it with me for a moment in your imagination. Shut your eyes. God's people as a beautiful ice sculpture, wonderfully frozen, firm, and solid, and safe, but with crazy Xerxes and hateful Haman and the ludicrous law that once favored, even though they are exiled and not in their promised land, that once favored sculpture that is God's people, it's starting to thaw. That annihilation law has brought the thaw. What a trend. For years, not a drip lost from the sculpture, but suddenly a thaw has begun. Quite a trend. For such a trend as this, September 15, 2022, headline on the internet by John Brown reads, Christianity quickly diminishing in U.S. on pace to become minority religion in decades, study shows. I clicked on it, and I saw the thaw right before my eyes. He writes, a recently released study suggests that the number of Christians in the U.S. is diminishing quickly and being replaced by those who do not identify with any religion. A new report by Pew Research Center and the General Social Survey published Tuesday found a surge of adults leaving Christianity to become atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. It predicted that if the number of Christians under 30 abandoning their faith accelerates beyond the current pace, adherence of the historically dominant religion of the U.S., Christianity could become a minority by 2045. That's one generation away. Noting how approximately 90% of Americans identified as Christians in the early 90s, 90%! The study observed that number, which includes children, had fallen to only 64% by 2020. Now, the story went on with more thawing, but bad news about Christianity in the U.S., but I will spare you from having to hear it. You heard enough, I hope, for such a trend as this, the Pew Research Center, a very respected research organization. They laid down the law. The number of Christians, Christianity seems to be evaporating. All part of a giant Christian thaw, as it were, in the U.S. Sounds a lot like Persia 2,500 years ago. For God's people, annihilation law leading to evaporation thaw. Hmm. For such a trend as this. There's a trend happening. Second phrase, for such a text as this. Many are well aware the book of Esther is the one book in the Bible that does not once mention the name of who? God. Right. So our mission outreach team chooses a verse to spur us on to outreach around the world in our neighborhoods and selects a verse from the one book of the Bible that never mentions the name God. Thank you, Mission Outreach Team. Now, you know I'm kidding. It's been a delightful challenge to craft this message. Yes, it has. For such a text as this, no mention of God. But that makes sense. Because there, God's people are in exile, but definitely enjoying the fruits of a very prosperous empire, Persia. And a very prosperous city, Susa. Most commentators are convinced that God's people here are spiritually far from their God. They saw Susa, and Susa was for them a dura. It drew them in and drew them to stay for now. They saw, and it was, well, quite a draw for them. So the fact that there is no mention of God likely indicates that it's been a while that they have answered God's command for them to draw near to him. Other things have gotten a hold of them. Other things are the draw for them. Why bring God into it? Why even mention him? Sounds a bit like today, doesn't it? If I'm honest with myself and I look back on each day and I reflect on it, I realize that I saw a whole lot of things that day and what I saw was meant to draw me in, whether I saw something that I could possibly buy, a luxury new toy, pickup truck I always wanted, new video game, 
Name your own material possession you saw and wanted on any given day. You saw it, and it was drawing you in. And think about it. I'm sure we have it a lot better even in this economy than God's people did back there in Susa, and not one mention of God. And then there's that person you saw who, you know, needs to hear about Jesus. You saw, but no draw there. Because, well, then you'd have to mention about God. And whenever God is mentioned, whenever Jesus is mentioned, your heart races and you start to sweat and your face gets red and you get embarrassed and things become awkward and you risk the person telling you, I don't want to hear about your God stuff. You go through your day and you saw, but there was no draw. And even if there was, would you know what to say? God's name always seems to throw a wrench in the conversation, and I don't know my Bible well enough anyway, and that gospel summary isn't embedded in my brain yet, and you saw but no draw for such a text as this. I'm one of God's people, but his name isn't a typical text running through my brain, let alone coming out of my mouth. For such a text as this, the text in my head is often as devoid of God's name as the book of Esther is devoid of God's name. I saw, but don't ask me to draw close to someone with it, to draw it out for someone. The world we live in makes it clear. Inserting God into it messes up the good times we still manage to live in with all the good things we can accumulate for such a text as this. Not one mention of God. Well, before we even get to the theme phrase, we're 0 for 2, aren't we? 0 for 2, but now we're here. We're here with Esther, right here, Mordecai's words echoing in her head for such a time as this. Who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this, to save your people, to save you, to save God's people. What are you going to do? And from what we read, it's obvious what's happening. The question has hit Esther like a ton of bricks. What are you going to do for such a time as this? What are you going to do? Queen Esther has entered the place called Hem and Ha. She's hemming and hawing. She sees Mordecai in turmoil and wants to know why. And when she finds out why, when she finds out that all of God's people are going to be annihilated, all of her relatives, close ones, distant ones, she's a study in hem and haw. I haven't been called before the king in 30 days. He's probably lost interest in me. And you know what happens when you approach the king without having been summoned? You're put to death. I don't think I can do it. Hem and haw. It's like a seesaw. She goes up. Can I do it? Uh, she comes down, no, I can't. When she sent that information about what might happen to her, to Mordecai, I wonder if she thought the matter was over, settled. If I just withdraw from the conversation, withdraw from any more contact with Mordecai, if I just withdraw and refuse to request an audience with the king, recuse myself, so to speak, this will all go away. I don't want to die. If I withdraw, I'll be fine. So with a ham and a haw, she gave to the servant what she thought was her final word to Mordecai. Leave me alone, Mordecai. My ham and haw have led me to withdraw. I'm out. Boom. Mic drop. But Mordecai doesn't let it rest. One more try. Esther, he writes... You're Jewish too. You're one of God's people. You're going to die too. But he doesn't quite say it like that, does he? Did you catch it? I saw it for the first time this week, or it meant something to me for the first time this week. Mordecai says, Esther, if you stay silent, if you hem and haw and you withdraw, the Jews will have relief and be delivered in some other way from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. 
And so when Mordecai now says, who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this, when he says it, he just told Esther the exact opposite of what she was thinking. She thought, I'll withdraw, and though the rest might perish, at least I'll be safe. And Mordecai tells her, no, Esther, if you withdraw, you will perish, and the rest of us will be saved. And the theme of our mission outreach week just became a whole lot more serious, didn't it? For such a time as this, God puts opportunities in our path and we hem and we haw and we withdraw like Esther wanted to do and there was a death sentence, a death sentence over her head. What sentence is over ours? Sweaty palms, embarrassment, awkwardness, possibly ridicule in such a trend as this world is in. But the thaw is not so bad yet that we'll face death, is it, that we'll perish. In some places it is, but not here. Ridicule, maybe some mockery, maybe an eye roll, but not much else. That, not much of a sentence, is it? Death sentence or ridicule, but then... You think about what Mordecai said. If you stay silent, if you stay silent, look what's going to happen to you. If we stay silent, God's going to make that happen? Is that what the text is saying? We're safe, right? Of course we are. We're safe. But the text sure reminds us how serious this really is. The thing is, when we hem and haw, when we withdraw, have you ever stopped to think, and I'm sure Esther didn't go back in her room and laugh, but when you think about it, when we hem and haw and withdraw, and when the opportunity to share the good news of God, of Jesus, is before us, It's kind of like a laugh or a good guffaw, a guffaw in God's face, to be sure. And a guffaw at the fact that there's a neighbor who maybe you struggle with, kind of at odds with, and maybe someday he's finally going to get his. And maybe all those celebrities who hate Jesus and those people who think differently politically than I do, and maybe there's a whole lot of people who I think don't deserve one word about Jesus. Well, the thought of them getting theirs brings a silent yet gleeful guffaw to my heart. So I ask myself, if I don't take that and them seriously for such a time as this for me to open my mouth with the good news to share with others, if I ham and haw, if I withdraw, is that just one big guffaw at God and at others made in his image who so desperately need Jesus? Asking that about ourselves. Pretty raw, isn't it? We didn't read this so we could build suspense, but a couple verses later, Esther does say, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. And maybe you know the story. She does go, and she wins the salvation of her people by Xerxes against evil Haman. For such a time as this, yes, she jaws with her king. She and the king jaw together, which simply means they talk. That's what the verb to jaw means, to talk, to have a conversation, to talk at length, to chatter. Yeah, to jaw. A time like this, she came to realize, was the time to jaw. Who needs you to jaw about Jesus in your life? Which neighbor, which coworker, which friend, who is it? Who has God put in your orbit For such a time as this, in such a trend as this, there's still people to tell. With such a text as this, we can still talk about Jesus for such a time as this. There's still time. 
to bring the good news. And that's really the point. We do this. We jaw about it with others. We don't hem and haw. We don't withdraw. We certainly don't guffaw. We jaw. We tell it out. Because for us, it's about for such a triune God as this. We have a saving God, the triune God, to tell others about. God the Father, who in love sent Jesus to us to die for the sins of the world. Ours too, to bring forgiveness on the cross. For us too, and to rise from the dead for our eternal life. And then poured out his Holy Spirit upon us so that we may believe in this triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a story to tell. What a story to jaw with someone about. You know, in linguistics, there's something called Grimm's Law. It's named after one of the brothers Grimm who wrote all those fairy tales. The brothers Grimm. Well, they didn't just write fairy tales. One of them, at least, was a brilliant scholar of languages and linguistics. And he figured out that when it came to languages, that different languages evolve over time and sounds become different from one language to the next. And one part of the linguistics law, one part he discovered was that sometimes when a language descends from another language, some of the sounds go from unvoiced sounds, sounds that don't use the larynx, the voice box, to voiced sounds. Sounds, sounds that do use the larynx, the voice box. For example, an SH sound is unvoiced or voiceless. Shh. Nothing used down here. All up here. Shh. But in the next language, it evolves into, it might become voiced. As in, zh, zh. Hear it down there? Grimm's Law said that's one way that languages can evolve. And friends, I think that needs to be us. In such a trend as this, with such a text as this, for such a time as this, for such a triune God as this, where we were once voiceless, one could say useless, when it came to the good news, we very much need to now be voicing the good news from unvoiced to voiced, from hemming and hawing to jawing, from useless to useful for such a time as this. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, We've heard it time and again, how we need to tell out the good news, reach out with the gospel, tell people about Jesus. We've heard it time and again. And we always shake our heads, yep, that's right. For such a time as this. That's right. Make it clear to us when we sort of reluctantly say, who is it? Who is it in my little neck of the woods? Who is it that I could talk to them about Jesus? When we reluctantly ask, who is it? Lord, we need for you to make it unbelievably clear because we're prone to miss it. Tell us who it is for each of us, in our hearts, in our minds. And then, Lord, give us the strength, the power, the joy of telling the good news to that person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.